Uh, so you can certainly hear the audio. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. <laughs> okay, so that works. Newsletter person, so I'm just going to take a few notes to report to the central office about the talk, but I forgot to bring your pen. I know, I know, it's kind of Asia, so I don't know. I'll just take a few notes. Lancaster lecture now. Um, our speaker is distinguished professor Carrie Mangerson. Uh, she is a distinguished professor of statistics at QUT in Brisbane. She is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Social Science, ASC Lloyd Fellow, and the deputy director of the ASC Center of Excellence in Mathematics and Statistics in St. Peter. Her research interests are based in statistics, highly structured models, and computational algorithms. According to the director of the Department of Health, Environment, Industry, Right. Tonight she's going to talk about uh, Asia Lancaster, who is uh, annual lecture is sustained at 
we did I tried to talk a little bit about it last time, but I had no idea. I just decided to put this beside today. If you're really good this year, we have someone who can speak uh, uh, for the digital capacity. Please join me in welcoming Terry. Thank you, Jeff. Um, introduction. Um, I'm as informed as you are, I think, about that, uh, Professor Lancaster. And I know that there are people in the room who are actually much more informed. So in the room here, how many people actually knew Professor Lancaster? Right. Okay, so we've got a number of people who are very informed. And perhaps afterwards we could hear some of their stories. So I'm going to go from what I could... Um, what I could uh, learn from him on the web, and excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold, so uh, I may uh, crackle and squeak a bit, but anyway, we'll see. So I want to talk about, uh, hang on, this is not working. Okay, right. Um, I want to talk about, uh, um, Professor Lancaster uh, in the context of his times and some of his work and then also related to some of the work that uh, is being done presently or that I've been involved in and also perhaps then at the end just reflect on what's to come. So uh, Professor Lancaster then was um, uh, um, around 1913 to 2001. The thing that um, really struck me about him was that uh, he, he went from actuarial and accounting studies through medicine to so he really sort of had this pipeline, if you like, or this, this different experience in computation, or sorry, in, uh, in developing methods and developing applications and developing theory. You can see that also through his areas in mathematical statistics, medical and public health statistics, history, statistical theory, and statistical bibliography. Uh, he was in the public health and tropical medicine in Sydney and in London from 1946 to 1959 and the Foundation Professor of Mathematical Statistics at the University of Sydney here in 1959 to 1978. Uh, importantly for the Statistical Society, he was one of the co-initiators of the Statistical Society of New South Wales in 1947. He was the founding editor of the Australian Journal of Statistics and the co-founder and first president of the Australian Mathematics uh, Association. In terms of his uh, research achievements, he had achievements in medical uh, research and also in statistical research. So in medical research, he has about 50 articles in the Medical Journal of Australia, for example, and other uh, um, publications. Uh, for example, and just as a couple of them, a definitive verification of the association between maternal rubella and childhood deafness, and the discovery of associations between uh, mel melanoma and latitude, sunlight intensity. Now I'll come back to those as well as things that are going on uh, today as, uh, in the area of environmental exposures and health. In statistics then, some of his achievements were the definitive work on world mortality. And this definitive work was about 600 pages. So um, just talking about books that are being currently written, uh, this man had one which persevered. Um, so it's on one that, uh, uh, that's been uh, in the process of being written. So 600 pages was sort of the aim for this, so here. Uh, geographic uh, aspects of melanoma and the structure of bivariate distributions, just some of the, the areas in which he worked and that I'll come back to as well. So for thinking about his work and thinking about the work in the present, I was interested in four areas. So areas of data acquisition, areas of environmental exposures, areas of epidemiological outputs, and multivariate data. So in acquisition, um, I'm, I thought about how he was using medical records and how today the kind of information that we have is very, very much more varied um, than was available then. So from medical records to digital census, I'll talk to you a bit about that. From going from melanoma and latitude to some of the work currently in air quality and health, from going from the expectations of life to books that were written to an online Australian Atlas of Cancer, which I'll describe, and also going in talking about multivariate data, 
from bivariate distribution to understanding the multivariate relationships in higher dimensional data. So again, this sort of uh, uh, combination of theory, computation and application. So if we think about the first one of those, which is data acquisition, um, this is a, a photo of, uh, uh, in, in my family album here, this is me, and uh, this is the way that you used to get around, well not so much, not that old, but, uh, but the way that uh, perhaps information was collected. Um, and so between medical records and censuses or surveys, going out and getting information um, in, you know, in a physical form like this. Um, Sensor information was, this is uh, my, my grandfather's great aerial. So this is uh, how he managed to uh, put bicycle wheels up and, and to get television to his house. And of course, through the medical <coughs> records, through this kind of um, on-site data gathering and the various techniques that people went through to be able to access the digital world, we now go to the present where we have satellite data. We have various devices connected to our mobile phones and we have all sorts of wearables. So who in the room here has some sort of fitness wearable or health wearable? Okay, so we see here um, that there's a lot of uh, um, information that we can gather from different sources, a variety of data, a variety of data sources. And some of those, then this is just increasing the amount of information that we can gather. We know this, the statisticians, this is our bread and butter about how we analyze this kind of information, how we trust this kind of information, how we make decisions and um, inferences from this kind of information. And so one of the questions that um, we, we talked about and wrestled about with a, a number of people is as we get this flood of data, then, and we're all trying to understand how we can analyze these data, one of the questions <laughs> might be, do we need to analyze all of the data? Um, so, or can we be more intelligent about how we actually select the data that we need? And so maybe if we do that, then we don't have to worry so much about the, the data quality issues, or we can at least have an assessment of those data quality issues. So if we have a specific question, do we need to analyze all of the data, or could we go back to the time of our Lancaster and colleagues and use some design principles, some experimental design, some survey design principles um, that, um, that were developed around those times to select the data required to answer the question. And so if we think about this then, for this first tranche of making the connection between Lancaster's time and the current times, we can think about then a decision analysis approach to experimental design. So we can select the optimal settings D in some design space of options. For example, we can um, maximize the expected return as quantified through some sort of utility function um, with respect to Y, which is a future data set that can be observed when that design is applied. So if we think of this in this sort of decision theoretic framework and we develop a design to maximize our utility, then um, an example of that is when we have a regression and we have a, um, a measurement covariate and our study objective is to learn about the parameters of theta in a regression equation or a regression function and then we want our design points then are going to be uh, determined to maximize that utility function. And so our utility function in this case might be based on the variance of our estimator um, that targets the true unknown theta. So if we think about that then, in a Bayesian framework, we're going to focus on the expected gain in Shannon information and um, or the, um, from the prior to the posterior distribution or the spread of the posterior distribution. So our optimal design then is going to maximize this expected utility um, over this design space with respect to our model parameters and our future data. So we're interested in this D star then, this optimal design. If we think about that, then we can have a static design or we could have an adaptive design. In other words, we can start off with a small subset of data, develop our, um, our, our model or our, our estimates of our parameters, and then determine 
which new observations we might require in order to be able to optimise our utility. So if we think about having a large set of data, instead of analysing all of those data, what we could do is lay down this design, either the static design or the, uh, the adaptive design, and extract the observations that, are, that fall into that design space. And in order to, in doing that, then we are going to optimise the number of the observations that we obtain in order to answer the question that we set up beforehand. So we can answer questions of interest, we can have sequential learning here, we can assess data quality because if we can't see those design, those observations corresponding to our design points or around a particular desi design window, then that might tell us about some of the, uh, the, the biases or missingness in our data. We can, um, we can assess model quality as well, which is probably if we analyse all of the data, then how do we so-called shake our model or understand the, um, the model robustness? Whereas in this case, we can keep laying down this design or change the model design um, to be able to understand about the model robustness. And we can also enlarge the loss function in a reasonably obvious way to um, include model misspecification or time constraints and so on. So just as an example of how this works, if we have six covariates and a million records in, a, um, in, a, in an example, then we want to identify the important covariates for prediction and have accurate and precise parameter estimates. We could start out with a sample of a thousand observations, create our prior distributions um, from that. We can then value add to the information gained through a sequential design process um, and use uh, some new um, computational techniques like sequential Monte Carlo for the fast computation. So for each new data point, we're going to update the prior information to reflect the information gained based on a 95% credible interval for the parameters. We can also do variable selection on the way through because if any parameter is not um, you know, if any of the credible intervals is not within some kind of tolerance, tolerance limit, then we can drop it from the model. We can also then refit the reduced model and rerun, and then we continue until we've got a certain number of data points or we meet some kind of stopping point according to our utility. So as an example for our, um, our regression problem, if we have different tolerance levels, you can see there, uh, and that they will correspond to different covariates from the six covariates that we had to start with. We get parameter estimates here. And the important thing is that we can, we can um, obtain our uh, desired inferences based on only 3% of the data. So we don't need to analyze all of the data here. We can analyze a very small proportion of the data and still be able to obtain our desired inferences. We learn about the design holes, we learn about model robustness. The problem is that it takes a long time to run. So the question then is, if it takes a long time to run, then what, why would we just not do random sampling? Well, it turns out that in the same kind of time that we would take for this um, to do a random sample approach, no random design provided as much information as the parameter values of, as um, we find from the design approach. So this is an, um, something that is still uh, needs some exploration in more complex designs and other sorts of data sets, but really holds promise, I believe, um, as a complement perhaps to more of the exploratory approaches where we try to analyse all of the data. In this case here, we can use some of the techniques that were available and been developed in Lancaster's time to really learn about how we might analyse in an intelligent way or collect data in an intelligent way in our present times. So if we think now to the second point, which is about environmental exposures, then uh, these are two of the, uh, the uh, publications that I pulled out of uh, Professor Lancaster's uh, CV, and they're about um, epidemiological uh, assessments. So again, as we said, these are all based on the medical records. And if we try to translate that to what we do today, and we think about these new data sources that we have, 
And I'd like to tell you about one study that we have been doing that's, um, that's of interest. So this is Laura Dawkins from Exeter University. She came out to Australia to, uh, uh, to work with us on a project where we're looking at using mobile air quality sensors. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of one of those in a minute. In fact, you can see it here. This is my glasses. This is the, uh, the air quality sensor in here. What Laura is interested in was understanding how we might give information, more personalised information, to cyclists or people, uh, pedestrians in an, in an urban area in the context of a lot of change in the environment. So we have a major construction project going on in Brisbane. Uh, so how should pedestrians or cyclists move around the city, taking into account the different criteria that they might have in terms of their exposure to air quality, poor air quality, uh, their time constraints, and their enjoyability. So Laura came um, to visit us, and this is uh, her work. So the problem is um, that exposure to air pollution is associated with air, uh, respiratory diseases and cancer. The current mobile apps and websites that are available really give this sort of one size fits all. And the question then is, how do we make that more personal? So we, could, we looked at developing a Bayesian spatio-temporal model to create a map of PM 2.5 exposures along potential cycle routes um, use, using high resolution data from these mobile air quality sensors. And using then a Bayesian decision framework to create a user-specified multi-attribute uh, utility function here. So we're going to try to elicit a user's journey preferences regarding the health impact of exposure to this PM2.5, so the small particles, um, journey time and journey enjoyment, and develop a, a, um, an R-Shiny app to elicit that information, and then based on that, to be able to identify personalised optimal routes um, to be able to maximise the expectation of this function. So I'd like to tell you about uh, how, how we've gone with that. So our data collection came from a number of places. We had Strava information so for, uh, for bikes, so we had a Strava heat map here. We had cycle-friendly routes that were provided by the, uh, the council. We had, uh, we, we had start and finish times. We um, encountered traffic around the different routes here. Um, that was all, that's what we ended up with. We had different kinds of information about where there were bike um, uh, cycle stations, bike racks, and so on. Uh, the area in Brisbane was set up into the, or segmented into the CBD, the Botanic Gardens, and South Bank here. And, uh, and all of this led to identifying a number of routes, potential routes, that cyclists might take through the city. Okay? So this was our starting point then to say, well, all right, where would you ride? So let's say Matt has come from Wollongong and um, knows Brisbane reasonably well um, and wants to jump on his bike, go for a ride um, to get from A to B and uh, wants to be able to have a personalised understanding of what that health impact and time and enjoyability might be. So what kind of um, information do we have in the temporal setup? We have uh, city cycle information, we have where people are cycling and when, a lot of different sources of information that we can bring to bear on developing uh, this problem. So we took these air quality sensors, they're called koalas, um, it's an acronym for something that I can't remember right now. Uh, so it consists of a sensor box, a solar panel, um, a a carbon monoxide sensor inlet, dust sensor outlet, and uh, collects uh, PM2.5, PM10, and so on. So um, the information we were interested in was PM2.5 for every five seconds while you're, you're riding around, and the calibration was um, undertaken as well to make sure that we were getting reasonable results. So the, this was the, the data that um, we obtained then for the different runs. So we, uh, Laura worked out a design. Um, we, uh, we borrowed the people from our lab to do the, the replicate cycles. 
Um, so they, uh, we had the two different cycle paths, cycle options, and uh, we did this route multiple times for different times of the day, two times in the morning, different periods in the morning, two times in the afternoon, uh, two days of the week, and then one day on the weekend. Originally, it was a much richer design until we worked out how many people that would take. And so, um, so we decided to cut it down to this. So this was what the, uh, the routes look like in terms of the um, PM2.5 exposure. And uh, we wanted to then develop a model. So we used the expert insight um, from the, uh, the International Laboratory for Air Quality and Health and cyclists' um, insights to direct the covariate selection. Um, and you can see there the types of covariates that we had here um, at the time slot level and then also <coughs> at the observation level. Yeah. Right, so what we end up with then is a model at the grid cell level, which looks like this. We have for day um, D, time slot T, grid cell S, we have a model that talks about the adult PM2.5 at the grid cell level is going to be a function of our covariates that we have. Plus here, we have um, a, a, a spatial random effect with an exponential spatial correlation function. And the correlation function is given by the spheres you can see going over the distance. So this is what our correlation um, function looks like here. And this is the mesh that's set up in INLA, which is an um, integrated um, nested Laplace approximation uh, that's set up to, to, un to, uh, to underpin our spatiotemporal models. So we specified um, joint prior means for the different effects based on the direction that we thought the uh, relationship should have and we had an exponential spatial covariant structure over this region here. So these were the results based on that grid level data. We have a mean spatial random field and a standard deviation of that field. We wanted then to see what our predictive capability was like. So we, we excluded the last um, um, day, um, day seven of the afternoon and uh, then predicted it. So the red points are our predictions of course, I'm showing you this because we're very proud of it. Actually, you might be almost as proud of it, not quite. So you can see that we did pretty well there, and we can also predict what the um, the, the PM 2.5 uh, levels would be on that missing day. Um, now we want to add another level, which is our observation level, and we can do that as well. So we're just going to add another layer. So here are our data, our observed Ys now, coming from each um, observation. Um, again in the grid cells and this gray here is almost like our replicate preliminary and really lots more answers here. And so we have our covariates that are included here at the same resolution as the observations and then we also have some um, covariates that are at the same resolution as the spatiotemporal grid. So we have the same mesh here but we're going to have a different projection matrix because this is going to go on to the observed locations. So same sort of model. When we do that, these are our results. So now we can get results down to the um, refiner level. Um, we have a mean random field here and the standard deviation of the random field. We get our posterior estimates for our parameters. And, um, and again, we have some predictive capability. And you can see there now that we start to see a slight bias um, based on these, uh, these uh, individual level data. So we're still working on that. Uh, and we have predictive capability to be able to tell us about, um, to predict in any location or along a route at regular intervals. So the question then is, can we do something even um, to, to try to rectify that, uh, that slight bias? And so we looked at a barrier model, and the barrier model says that you can't go anywhere to anywhere over your space. It's actually like defined groups. And so we looked at what happens in the CBD, what happens in the Botanic Gardens, what happens in South Bank. And so we set up our barriers um, around those blocks, but also then within the blocks to say, well, you know, when you're cycling, you just can't like cycle, well, you can cycle through a building, but sort of <laughs> not, not all the time. Okay. So um, these were the results then when we set up the barrier models. Now again, you're just sort of going, okay, you're showing me more and more of these pictures, but, um, but you can just sort of see, or hopefully get an impression of how much, um, 
more realistic, if you like, these pictures are starting to get because now we have it at the observation level but the, and at the roof level, like it's instead of just being a general field. So we found that to be very useful in terms of refining this model. Um, so you can see now from the, the, um, the figures here that we get a slightly better fit in the, um, in the top left hand corner there. We can then look at, once we've got this, we can look at our accumulated exposure over the roots. And so we have different kinds of exposure that we're going to have um, for the different kinds of um, commutes, an early commute or a late commute, um, and uh, the different uh, routes that might be taken. And then we can make choices between the routes. So if we just look at the two potential routes that we can take, um, then we might have this route here, which is um, the blue route, which is faster, which you're going to go through all of the CBD to get to um, uh, into town, or you can go or from in town, but the other one you can do is to go from, and we are actually seeing all by pressure, but you can then go through the garden. So this is the botanic gardens here. So a much more enjoyable route, takes a bit longer, less um, air, air pollution. So, now, this then would depend on very slightly, but still in, indicative of the kinds of decisions you might make about um, your preferences with respect to exposure. So how might we formulate that? Well, we formulate it in terms again, um, as we did for the, the first trench uh, that I was talking about, which is based on your expected utility. So we're going to have a utility here, which is going to be formulated in terms of a at the outcomes or the states of nature or consequences, we have our data, we have the payoff here, we have the utility function, and then the joint density is the outcomes given the data. So what are the outcomes that we're interested in? We're interested in health risk and time. Um, so our model is going to tell us about those and we're going to have an, an um, illicit personal utility function by asking about how risk averse someone is, so that might be very risk averse to exposure from um, to poor air quality, then it might be much more interested in getting to work earlier. And um, we're going to then look at fitting this, um, this log surface on, based on the responses. And we can also incorporate some sorts of um, criteria preferences into this. So we entered, what we did was, um, oh, that was a bit of a royal we, what Laura did was develop this uh, shiny app here. And I'll show you a glass of this in a minute, but basically this is your personalized cycle route decision tool. And so you enter the journey details, you elicit, um, elicit the uh, personal journey preferences, you have best and worst case scenarios that can be defined based on those preferences. And then you can use those um, preferences then to determine the kinds of decision relevant attributes that you might need in terms of the health impact, the journey time, and the enjoyment. Now, notice that I'm not asking Peter Green about cycling because this is a tiny little cycle through the city here. Peter's already said that he's been on two major cy um, cycling trips this year already. So down in Tasmania and, um, and in India. So, um, I'm, this would be a real test for that, so I have to do that. Okay, so just blowing this up, um, you have the, the, um, the R Shiny app that's going to ask you for your personal journey preferences here in relation to one another. How important are these journey outcomes for you? And you have a slider that you can say how important they are that shows you the, the routes and so on. So you can sort of see how this is working, okay? And um, then you can also talk about different scenarios and get some sense of, instead of asking directly about these parameters, get some sense of how people are balancing these priorities and from that then extracting the information. So just as a simple case study then, we have these two journey types we can take um, through the gardens or um, through the city. We have different um, times that we can do these, uh, these journeys. And what we might do then is elicit from that app the different um, values for the different priorities, the health and journey time and enjoyment. And if the primary concern, for example, is, is impact, and then the second one is journey time, then those K values might turn out to be this, um, which we show how we can work out an expected utility then, which would show that the first option there is 
going to be the preferred option based on your personal criteria. But you can say your importance was, if you said that um, we wanted to, uh, David wanted to, to, to work faster and then worry about himself, then he's going to be going for um, option Okay, so you can sort of see how this works. So it was of interest to us to see how we go from this data collection right through the process to a personalised um, decision-making tool in this framework. So the third tranche then um, is about epidemiological outputs. And this text that um, Professor Lancaster wrote which is the expectations of life, is a, as I said, a 600 page book. And it's really, really useful, as we know about books, and we've talked about some of the ones that are, that are um, uh, being written now. So many of the books that are being written now have tools in them that are going to live past the life of the book. Many of the books we have have the fundamental material in them um, that, that we build on um, for our, our current research but they stay as static material. We know now that we have access to such a range of, um, of uh, sources and resources that can be updated. Okay, so how do we create something? Or, so what we have now is the ability to not just have a book, but we can have something that's more online, we can have something that's more updatable, something that's more interactive um, and again, able to pull out information that's personally um, important to us. So if we do that, then so what we've been looking at is building um, an online um, uh, digital product that again gives us some information about expectations of life. And in this case here, this is about cancer. So this is our Australian Cancer Atlas here that uh, we released late last year. and. Um, and I'm just showing it off because it's a, well, it's a digital product. And I wanted to just contrast the, the book that um, Professor Lancaster published and this kind of digital product that, uh, that is available now because of the tools that we have um, uh, in the modern day. So this is a, um, a digital atlas. It gives uh, um, in, um, estimates, posterior estimates. There's a Bayesian model underpinning this. So it gives posterior estimates of standardised incidence of, um, of about 20 cancers, uh, incidence and relative survival. Relative survival is given in terms of excess deaths. So we have here for each area at an SA2 level, so there's about 2,000 of these, and each area here um, gives those um, estimates with some uncertainty around them. And then we're using meta-analysis models then to be able to um, to analyze that publicly available data at that coarser level to interrogate it uh, in the data for things like, are there differences between rural and urban areas with respect to um, cancer and cancer outcomes? We found in Queensland, for example, that uh, based on a, a study that we did just for the uh, Queensland Atlas, that there is indeed a big difference in, in terms of survival for people in the country and people in the bush. And that, that work that was done on the basis of that cancer atlas, as Professor Lancaster also published in much of the work that he did based on his um, expectations of life book, we found that that really has provided the ammunition or the evidence for Cancer Council Queensland to go into that with, uh, with policy makers. And in fact, changed the subsidies that um, rural people receive to access treatment in, um, in, uh, in what, that's available only in the urban areas. So we'd like to take credit for that. It's not just because of the um, Bayesian models that underpin the, uh, the uh, Queensland Cancer Atlas, but, uh, but we do believe that this kind of evidence that we can produce is really important, this data-based uh, uh, evidence. So this atlas now is an online tool. Um, it gives quality, um, small area, uh, spatial patterns in cancer incidence and survival across Australia and uh, had a lot of funding from different organisations as you can see there uh, and was strongly supported by AIHW um, 
and it had these components. So we had to obtain the data, we had a spatial smoothing model, visualization of the results in the digital architecture. So I'll just take you through these very quickly then. Getting the data, we obtained information from all eight Australian state and territory cancer registries. Now that statement there is just a two line statement that took us about a year and a half to actually accomplish. Seeing some nods around the room for getting that together, we thought that this was actually one of the major achievements of the whole project was to be able to get this information together. We've got about 20 cancers. We have this for a cohort of, um, of people aged 15 and over and uh, the data is stored on a, on a secure uh, computing facility and we used it at the, um, the SA2 classification for the geographical areas. So uh, we have cancer diagnosis rates, which I said, and then also excess deaths uh, within five years. Um, and, and the interpretation of these values was also something that was a, uh, uh, of great debate. So the, uh, what we did um, in terms of the interpretation was to look at how do we actually give some insight into what's a big number in terms of um, excess deaths or um, standardised incidents. And so we looked at the cancer diagnosis rate compared to the Australian average. And we said, is it larger than the Australian average or smaller than the Australian average? And, um, and then what we can do is um, use a, oh, we'll get to the visualisation in a minute, but the spatial smoothing model was really a LaRue prior, um, which is going to be just our usual sort of, we have our counts here, terms of uh, cases here, having a Poisson distribution with some expected value based on age and sex um, contrib uh, 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 contributions from the population in that area. And then we have this relative risk here. So this is our relative risk um, is going to then be a function of the some covariates that we might have, plus then the spatial term, and then some um, unstructured uh, residual. And the spatial term in this case, um, unlike what we did in the, uh, the um, uh, sensor and air quality data, was really to look at each area as a, um, as a, the information from the neighbors was going to contribute to a particular area. And so this spatial term here was based on a conditional order regressive prior, but it has an extra parameter here, rho, which is the amount of um, information that we want to attribute to those, those neighbours as opposed to the overall average. So this LaRue prior we found to be very useful for us um, in this context. Remembering that we have 20 cancers um, in Australia, and so Australia has about 2,000 small area uh, SA2 um, areas, and most, most of those, you can guess where they are, are in the cities. Okay, so they're really clustered in a small part of Australia, and the rest of the country is very, very small population. So it not only breaks a lot of modeling rules, but it breaks a lot of visualization rules as well, as you can imagine. So we want to be able to have, and also then we have different cancers with different levels of, um, of uh, commonness. Um, so we have very common cancers, we have some very rare cancers as well. So coming up with a model that would allow us, a general model, that would allow us some flexibility to model those different cancers in the Australian context was really a challenge. And I'd, and I'd be very happy to talk to anybody who's um, got some opinions about that. So this is our effect of spatial smoothing. We know this as statisticians, we know that this is going to have some sort of, you know, dampening effect on our small numbers of cases that are more extreme and more in terms of being away from the average. And again, a dampening effect on the, um, the uh, credible intervals as well. So when we come to visualization, which is what I wanted to, to show you mostly, was um, we had project workshops and we were talking about how do we actually show these differences from the Australian average. And so we talked about then each area as having some probability of being like how, how far away from the Australian um, average is it? So what's the probability of it being um, above or below the, um, the Australian average? And so uh, depending on whether it's um, um, larger or smaller than the Australian average. So the first um, model of course was just our usual chloroplate map here. And, uh, and also then with this kind of bar here, the hit bar, the 
Australia would be or below the Australian average or above the Australian average. So this is the SA2s, how many SA2s in the Greater Sydney area were below the Australian average, so somewhere close to the Australian average or above the Australian average in terms of the population. Okay, so similarly for Greater Melbourne and, um, and so on. And so you could uh, have different view notes of this, but this gave you some information about, you know, how important were these different colours, because you can always have colours on the map. So just blowing that up a bit for a particular area then, for the first time, Australians could go in and have a look at a particular area. So let's say that you lived in Bow Desert and you were interested in what happened in Bow Desert, then you would, would see here your, um, your standardised incidences, which were about diagnoses and the, um, the relative survival, which was about excess deaths. And then you can see for existing cancers, if you were interested in melanoma, then it would show you whether you were strongly above the Australian average or somewhere nearby. And this has been a little sort of text interpretation that we gave to it as well. So based on a number of um, focus groups that we held to see if we could actually say these things in a way that people would understand. Um, this is a plot then. So if you click on a particular area um, here or you're interested in a particular area, you can sort of see how it, how it fares according to the, or compared to the Australian average. So we came up with these B plots. Um, again, be really interested in your take on this as well. Uh, so we looked at wave plots. Um, this wave plot is our visual sort of density with basically a box plot under here, except we're working with designers. So it can't be straight with um, white boxes, it's got to be circles and But anyway, it sort of looks roughly like we wanted it to. Uh, we have this V plot as we talked about, and also just the transparency. So could we do something with transparency to tell us about the uncertainty as well as the point estimates for these maps? And finally, the digital architecture for this, where we had to, uh, um, a lot of work went into um, designing this with our um, visualisation and e-research group. Okay, and, um, and then developing the website itself. So if anybody's interested, please have a look at the Australian Cancer Atlas and any feedback, I'm very um, happy with. How am I going for time? 15 minutes? Okay, and finally, the translation of this. So we've got this atlas up now, and we have 20 cancers. We have information at um, all of these SA2 levels around the country. Uh, the first thing we've done is look at um, rural or remote questions. But there's many other questions we can ask. And so we're in the process now of asking, well, you know, now that we've got this, what can we do about it? So how do we do the translation of that? And how do we actually then translate that into action? So the last point that, um, uh, or contrast I wanted to make between what um, Professor Lancaster was uh, doing in his time and now is in multivariate data. So some of the, um, the, the um, publications from Professor Lancaster uh, were the properties of um, bivariate normal distributions, the structure of bivariate distributions, and correlations and um, canonical forms of bivariate distributions. Critically, critically important in the kind of um, work that we do now, of course, understanding those bivariate structures. But as our data sets have grown, and as we're interested more now in um, well, as well in um, high dimensional data, then we're taking this bivariate distribution to a really multivariate level and trying to understand what are the multivariate dependencies in our data. And so one of the big questions about that is about, um, about the dimensionality, the true dimensionality of our data. And many people in this room I know have worked in this area. So how do we think about the intrinsic dimension or the real dimension of the data. Most much of our data um, is, is, um, is collected in a, in a high dimensional space, but it lives in a lower dimensional space. And how do we understand that low, lower dimensional space? So this is really work by, this is um, Antonia de Miro, I don't know if you've managed to get an extra O for me today, but, um, but this is uh, the, uh, Antonia de Miro and colleagues' work, and, um, and then we've been obtaining some of this and, and applying it. Um, problems as well. So this is interesting in clustering by the local intrinsic dimension. So I just wanted to talk about this as the sort of the, 
one of the modern day takes of the of the work that Professor Lancaster was doing on bivariate distributions. So a small number of variables is often sufficient to effectively describe high dimensional ideas or data, sorry. Um, this is called the intrinsic dimension or can be called that. And, but, and that's common, we know that that's the case, but what we know also, but we haven't done a lot of is understanding how that intrinsic dimension might actually vary over a data set. And so, for example, you might have mixtures of principal components across a space. Okay, so so we, we're trying to understand, does the intrinsic dimension vary over the, um, the space or is it constant? So some examples of this where we might think it might vary are folded versus unfolded um, configurations in protein molecules. Um, active versus inactive areas of the, the brain. And so, you know, we can think about intrinsic dimension might be different in those different areas of the brain. Uh, we might have um, organisations with different um, service delivery profiles. This is a project that we're working on at the moment. Different organisations of different sizes delivering different services to different target groups. Um, and how do we understand whether they're doing a good job, benchmarking, and also who are their peer groups in that case, from the perspective of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the target organisation or the, the funding organisation. And so um, there's many entities like that where we want to do some sort of um, peer grouping or um, profiling uh, and, um, or benchmarking and we want to understand the intrinsic dimension perhaps or you know, the, the amount of um, activity within each of those organisations. And another example that we're looking at and I'll show you a little bit of is in sports teams. So we have sports teams then with different strategies for attack and defence, whether they're home or away, different kinds of sports, different kinds of games. And we want to understand perhaps there's something in the way that they play that's different that might tell us something more about that, that, um, that team's performance. So the aim then is to be able to cluster in this high dimensional space, regions that have the same local um, intrinsic dimension in, a, in this given data landscape. So the proposed approach um, is uh, for a homogeneous model, if we just look at um, the, like having no change over, over the space, then we have um, a homogeneous model where our data here is sampled from a density row defined on a manifold with an unknown intrinsic dimension. And we can think about D then being the intrinsic dimension that's going to such that the, the row, the density is approximately constant in the region defined by the second neighbour of each point. So we're going to look at each point and just assume that we have a sort of um, a approximately constant value of that density between second neighbours. Okay, and if we've got that kind of, um, of uh, structure in our data, just in terms of the distances between each points, then we can look at the, the distance then between the first and second neighbour of each observation, and the ratio of those distances will form a Pareto distribution. And then we can model this then as a Pareto distribution, a Pareto likelihood, and now we're in business. We have a Pareto likelihood, we have this unknown parameter D, we can put a prior on D, and we can estimate it. Okay, that's fine. So, um, what happens now if we have this heterogeneous model? Well, a natural thing to do would be to take this to a mixture. So now we have our data being sampled on a density row again, but that row now is on a union of K manifolds with varying dimensions, okay? And so um, each row here, row K is going to have a support of a manifold of dimension DK, and we're going to have a set of prior probabilities that a point belongs to each of the manifolds. So at the end of the day, we're going to estimate or want to estimate these different um, uh, these uh, dimensions, DKs, and we also want to be able to allocate each observation 
to the submonopoles. So the distribution of U working just through the same framework as before is that we're going to have this mixture of Pareto distributions here. And this latent variable um, approach is going to help us indicate which points belong to which manifold. So the usual kind of mixture of framework that we, that we set up uh, would give us information about our unknown parameters, in this case our unknown dimensions, and also the allocation of observations to the different submanifolds. Okay, so how does this work? Well, if we have a thousand points drawn from five Gaussians, this is uh, the work of um, the, the previous authors, um, Antonietta and co. So we have a thousand points drawn from five Gaussians in different dimensions here. These are the results that we get. So we get pretty good estimates, or no, it's another we, they got, uh, they got pretty good estimates for the, the different dimensions here. So we were interested then in, we have a, a collaboration with the Australian Institute of Sport and the Queensland Academy of Sport. And uh, Edgar, my postdoc here is uh, Ted Keen on basketball. So he just had to have a smell of this and he was into basketball and say, well, let's, let's look at the different sports. And uh, so we've got this um, player tracking technology. Who's into basketball here? Anybody? Who's into sport generally? Okay. Right. <laughs> right. So, okay, so you know the player tracking technology, it's going to be video with the games here. We have the player movement measurements across 25 frames a second. And we're interested in how is the placement of players in attack and defence uh, related to the success of the play. Okay, lots of, lots of studies that have been done on this, lots of spatiotemporal models and so on. Can we learn something from our intrinsic dimension of um, ideas? So do teams that have greater offensive um, ability produce successful shots from more unique locations in the court and do they create more shoot opportunities by passing the ball more effectively? And what could intrinsic dimensions tell us about the plays and the teams? So what we did was take this is a royal we, all of this is royal we, so Edgar uh, took a high resolution tracking, tracking um, raw data from the NBA season, um, looked at the play-by-play -play event descriptions and other statistics. Luckily, somebody had painstakingly coded the, um, the videos and they're available on, on um, YouTube, uh, the annotation of them. And for each play then, um, you can like, infer the location of the players at the moment of the shoot and the selected event. Okay, was the sh shoot successful or not? There were 15 games included in the analysis, but just for now, let's look at the game between the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Golden State, Golden State Warriors. So we haven't done this during this game yet, but um, but you can. Right, so what you can see here is just the circle fit of the players on the on the on the court. Um, the ball is here, and this is just for one of the teams. Uh, no, sorry, ball fit, both teams. Sorry, um, the away team is in green. I don't know if you can see them here, and the home team is in blue. So that's where they're placed. Right. So the aim is to create this or uh, to compute this intrinsic dimension using the shot chart data from the home and away team. So we split the setting um, data into two sets, field goal sh shots taken when the home team is attacking, and the same thing when the away team is attacking. Um, we have number of rows, it's the number of attempted field shots, and the number of columns is for each of the players. Okay, so we've got 20 there, we've got their coordinates, we've got five players in each each. And so we want to know, comparing then, um, this intrinsic dimension, and in this case now, it's going to correspond to the number of independent directions in which these 20 dimensional um, points are embedded. So what's the strategy of location of the players on the field, on the field, on the court? So there's a range of results, and I just thought um, I'd show you this. This is just a box plot of the um, intrinsic dimensions uh, for the loss, uh, for the, the game outcome for the team that lost and the team that won. Um, um, in terms of the, when they lost and won, we also had lost away and um, won away and won home. And um, the lines here are the actual um, corresponding plays. So this is where they were joined up. Um, 
Actually, no, I'm sorry. This is for all of the games. And so that was when they were compared for games. So this is you know, one team versus the other team in the game. So this was the intrinsic dimension overall for the teams that lost and the teams that, um, that won. And you can see here that there's a higher intrinsic dimension for the teams that won, um, which is interesting. And the lines here is, um, is how the intrinsic dimension compared for the individual pairs of, of teams that were playing. So most of them are in the positive direction. Um, some of them, interestingly, are in a strongly negative direction. Okay, so I'm not sure why, really. But, um, but this means then that this team actually had like lower uh, um, intrinsic dimension even though they won in that particular pairing. But overall, we see this um, greater intrinsic or larger intrinsic dimension amongst the teams that won. This is the posterior means of the intrinsic dimension over the course of play for the first, just for the first three point field goal. Um, and so this is the, uh, the stamp of time down here and you can see as the time changes, um, during the course of just scoring this goal, you have very low intrinsic dimension to start with and you might imagine how this, this play is going. And then you get very high intrinsic dimension coming back to the middle, uh, intrinsic dimension. So in other words, at the start, um, nothing much happening, and then it really increases in terms of the intrinsic dimension and then decreases. So we're still trying to understand these results, but um, perhaps this is giving us some insight into the uh, different, uh, or different kinds of insights into this very highly um, or high multivariate data. So that then brings me to the last slide, and you can see that it's empty. And it's empty for a reason. I think that there could be here a, um, a pithy sort of conclusion slide or, or, or um, statement or conclusion. But really what I wanted to think about was we've come from Professor Lancaster's time and thought about data and, uh, and modeling and, um, and, um, and applications and inferences that we might make based on what is available and um, inside. We've come through now to the present time and talked about the different kinds of data that we might have, the different kinds of models that we can now fit, the different kinds of um, understanding we might have for um, this type of data. And then we come to the future. And so when you, speaking to the, the younger members of the, the group here, are in the position of retiring as an um, as Professor Lancaster did after a very long time here at the um, University of Sydney. It'll be very interesting to see what the world is like in terms of data and data science. And our understanding of these problems that I believe are still phenomenal problems that, that came with uh, from that time, still about epidemiology, still about uh, understanding of data, and still about expectations of life. So it will be a very interesting journey. For him, I'm sure, just as it has been for me, and I'm looking forward to seeing what it will look like, what this picture will be when it comes to a change. So, theta, so your understanding of theta is um, is increasing as you gather the information, as you gather the data. So you're just updating the data as it comes in, and then you're deciding or determining what the next tranche of data or the next single observation will be to improve your utility and update the value of theta. And you keep the old ones. Oh yes, yes, yeah. So you're just building on it. Yeah. So, so like, but the old ones might be very misleading for the new theta. 
Well, you're assuming that you're just coming from the same population. So you're just taking a sample from the population and, um, and then you're just updating it. It'd be the same as if you just took one, like you just had a, let's say a normal distribution, you took one observation and then you took another one and you're inferring about the population mean, you know, so you wiggle all over the place to start with and then you start to get more of a, um, a better estimate of it. Then that's fine. I mean, you, at the end of the day, you're going to use your um, your values of theta once you get to you know some like you, you may decide that this part of the the well all of it should be used it can, can be used but it's just going to be more variable at the beginning. Anyone else? Yeah, Professor Lancaster lecture in this room. <laughs> have they have they changed? This this theory this theory is just going to be very important. Very important. Other people will be lacking. Mm -hmm. I'll just I'll just come back to your question. It's it's actually a really good question in that only you only discover about space as you do. So you do I, I I acknowledge your question and your concern because you do have to be careful about how you're setting up that um, that sampling strategy, which you don't just you know, go down a local mode. So that that was I think the point of your question also. Yeah. But yeah. you're right, you do have to be careful with that. Mike, okay, I'm just curious about the yeah. Have you got perhaps some way of measuring this in terms of those plots that are applying to the same way? Yeah, so what um, yeah, so what we've been doing at the moment is just because we have this as a as an NCMC sample, and then each iteration we can say, you know, we can work out what the probabilities are one inside and the other. And so that's that's exactly what we've been doing. Um I Carrie, I, I I would suggest that the San Antonio um, being that low is because they play well as a team. Oh. <laughs> and they're a very good cohesive group and they've won lots of titles. Um, and they don't play individual basketball. And it makes sense that they're down there. If anyone oh. follows the NBA. And that's really interesting actually because how we might interpret the intrinsic dimension, we might say, because my, my first interpretation was the team that was going to have more of a larger intrinsic dimension is a well, I would say the NBA generally is all kind of a, a me first league, and the San Antonio Spurs are not a me first team, right. and it shows. That that's actually why, made that's a lot why of sense. Need people like this <laughs> rather than me. Okay, no, great. That's perfect. Uh, so, with that NBA, does it make, does it have predictive power? Can you sort of analyze two teams this year and see which one you think will win? Yeah, um, that's the next stage. Um, I'm hoping so, because if we do, then I won't come and tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, good question. Good question, actually. I'm not, I'm not, um, we're, we're looking at what the predictive um, capacity is, and we're not sure. Yet. So, um, I just want to leave you with the intrinsic dimension stuff. You know the theory with all the samples and all the best in terms of what you do with when you send it across five samples. Oh, in terms of the, the numbers, yeah. So you, you you have the numbers of um oh I see what you mean. So even just shots like the like whether you make the or not a certain percentage larger number of shots. Good point. So that we, we get to dinner quicker. Um <laughs> in in the questions now. Um but please join me in, in thanking Carrie for <laughs> For those who are as we meet for dinner and stick around for, I guess we walk over to the restaurant. Yeah, so it's about 20 minute walk. Yeah. Ask your students about that. Yeah. It's about they, 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 they tend to play their own yeah. as yeah. opposed to the other. Although Golden State.